very scientific series of subjects sets off today's show. I'm Carl Azus. We are your objective source for world news. And today, that begins with an international study that suggests air pollution may be damaging to people's ability to think. The study came out Tuesday in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Scientists. What researchers did was examine information from a survey conducted in China. It contained verbal and math test scores given to 32,000 people between 2010 and 2014. And the study found that the more polluted their counties were at the time of the test, the more their test scores went down. Researchers say the biggest difference was found in older, less educated men. And as far as dangers go, the study suggests that air pollution could increase people's chances of developing diseases like Alzheimer's and dementia. The study was specific to China, a nation with several cities that have grappled with severe air pollution, but researchers say the findings could be applied to countries around the world. One thing scientists didn't find out was how pollution could hurt the brain. And some folks not involved in the study are skeptical. National Public Radio spoke to James Hendricks, an official with the Alzheimer's Association, and he says he doesn't think a direct cause between air pollution and brain function can be proven, that part of the study's findings are speculative. He adds that as far as Alzheimer's goes, other factors like diet, social interaction, and exercise all play a role in people's risk for developing the disease. 10 Second Trivia According to NASA, what poses the greatest risk to space missions? Malfunction, debris, lack of funding, or war? There are millions of pieces of debris in orbit that are too small to be tracked. NASA says they're the greatest threat to missions. NASA also says something as tiny as a fleck of paint has damaged a number of space shuttle windows. So imagine what could happen if a satellite were hit by an object the size of a marble. NASA estimates there are 500,000 pieces of space junk that size, traveling as fast as 17,500 miles per hour. Defunct satellites, old rocket boosters, pieces of garbage from collisions, space debris is the result of 50 years of space travel and not a lot of work to keep space clean. Government and private sector organizations are working to track space junk and potential solutions are popping up on college campuses, too. has tiny little microscopic flaps and it only sticks when you apply a load to it. Each of these flaps lays down like this and you get very close contact. Of course, the reason there are so many man-made objects in space in the first place is because of the value they've brought in looking down at Earth. And it's not just about weather, tides, and population, it's about spying. During the Cold War, a period of intense rivalry after World War II between the Soviet Union and its allies and the United States and its allies, both major superpowers invested in spy satellites. And some of the engineers who worked on U.S. government programs didn't even know for sure they were helping the U.S. spy. They were sworn to secrecy, and they had suspicions that their work was internationally important. The project was declassified in 2011, so now they can talk about it. The program was conducted with strict need-to-know basis. Over the life of the program, about 100 miles of film was exposed providing almost a half a million images of the Soviet Union. It was a, a masterful performance. We couldn't tell anybody what we worked on. 
friends, family, even our wives. She was always fighting off somebody asking, what in heck does your husband do? He's never here. It was kind of tough in the early years, particularly at parties and stuff, and people would ask you, what do you do? Well, I'm an engineer. Yeah, you know, it's about all you could say. And I can remember quite well the feeling that we were contributing to something that we thought was important to the country. And fortunately, we're successful because I think it led to uh, a more peaceful world. I'm John Schaefer, worked at Eastman Kodak for 35 years. We worked in an area that we couldn't talk about while we worked there, and we used to call it research and engineering. Uh, it was the government side of the business where we worked on spy in the sky satellites. We didn't have a need to know what the government was doing, and we was drummed into us. We knew they weren't taking the pictures of amusement parks in the United States. <laughs> uh, we knew that it was foreign territory that they were looking at. Gambit was able to, at its best imagery, identify objects that were uh, smaller than one foot in size. It's one thing to know that an object is there. It's another thing to know how quickly it's advancing. So say we're interested in the development of an intercontinental ballistic missile. Gambit allowed us to not only identify its location, but we could identify whether or not it was becoming a more sophisticated weapon. So it was an effort really to safely observe what the Soviets and the Chinese and others were up to. Even to this day, we continue to classify the best resolution capability of the Gambit system. This is a building that was owned by the Navy, but Kodak had done a lot of work here. This is where it all started. My role was in the systems group. Image motion compensation was a very, very significant contributor to image resolution because a satellite is moving fast over the surface of the Earth. If you take high resolution photography with very long focal length lenses, you've got to either move the camera or move the film to avoid smear. We chose to move the film because you can't really pan the camera. We firmly believe that we helped the U.S. government and the U.S. Air Force understand what the threat to the United States was. I feel that most of us were very proud of the work we did. It would save lives, so to the extent that we could contribute to this program, I felt good. There was a feeling of patriotism because what we were doing was over and above anything anyone could hope to work on. A lot of the people that graduated from school at the same time I did were drafted and went into the service and were in areas. We had deferments because of what we were doing. You knew there were people out there that were making bigger sacrifices. And if there's anything we can do to stop that, it was well worth working on. For 10 out of 10, a college course in robotic musicianship. What the program aims to accomplish is interaction between people and machines, using the strength of both to create new kinds of music. Everything from prosthetic hands used by amputees to an improvising robotic marimba player is part of it. You've got to love music and you've got to love technology to take part, but students say whatever you do, don't call it musical robots. Because if you've got the drive and the sensor to affect your music with a motor, and you're able to get a handle on a whole list of egregious tasks without hiding from a challenge, this could machine music and technology to divorce shocking new heights or bring it right back down to autonomous Mozart classics. I'm Carl Azus, and that's CNN 10.